this report for us? I reloaded. Oh yeah, I'm loaded for bear. Uh, checking accounts got eleven hundred and four dollars in it at now. Now that Russ took his money. Oh yeah. Eleven hundred and four dollars is the is, the, is our is our treasury. Chuck, I'd like to turn to Chuck. You have an announcement you'd like to make, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Chuck Gass. You are a I've been a member of the club for since the beginning of where I was here, but some of you may not re recognize me. But a couple of weeks ago, we had the high five students from the high school here, as you may recall. And one of the one of the students was a boy by the name of Colin Spencer, as you may remember. Now, Colin uh, had just signed a Division One golf scholarship for the University of Connecticut, and. Um, he was a little bit um, shy about his achievements, and the superintendent had to ask him, well, Colin, what have you achieved this spring? And he had to say, well, I, was, I, was, I won the state uh, junior championship uh, uh, at a golf outing. Now, if I had been, if I had been uh, fast enough on my feet, I would have said, but Colin, what else did you achieve in that golf outing? And the answer is, his his, the golf outing was up in the Foxborough area somewhere where the coast I'm not aware of. <laughs> but as his coach said, the pin placements were barbaric. Barbaric. Which I don't know what that means, but it was pretty difficult. Anyway, Collins shot a two under par 70, but more significantly, he won the championship by 11 shots. So he's pretty good. <laughs> Now, as you may know, to graduate from Mashpee High School, you have to have a, pro a senior project. And Colin's project this year is a continuation of a tournament that's been held, a golf outing that's been held for a number of years, uh, basically in support of a boy by the name of Casey Fitzgerald, who was on the golf team and who was diagnosed with stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he's been treated at um, Dana-Farber, uh, and they've had this golf outing for a number of years, and Colin, for his senior project this year, is having a golf outing uh, for, in support of Casey, but the funds will go to the Jimmy Fund and, and Dana Father. The golf outing is on uh, April 24th, and I was interested in finding out if there's anybody in, the, in our club who would like to uh, sign up and play on a foursome for this golf on. It's on a Sunday, starts at 1 o'clock. Um, so I've give, I'm, I've, I'm going to ask Burke if in his minutes he would give uh, my contact information if anybody is interested. The deadline for this is April 15th. Uh, the, other th op the other way we could get involved is that there is an opportunity for a, golf, a, go a whole sponsorship for $100. And I would put up $50 if any of the members would put up the balance, whether one person does it or uh, 50 people do $1, that would be fine. But we'll put up the balance. We'll, we will we'll put up the balance. So we can at least do that. We, we guarantee it'll be covered. And, the, and that's what is very good because the, match, uh, the club has been very good about it. So if there's anyone interested, uh, you can either see me after or, or, or through, through uh, Burke, you can get my telephone number and contact information. Thank you. Just like to go right away to, if we could, to the secretary's report. <clears throat> All I've got is the minutes of the March 1 meeting, which was circulated, and uh, the, the motion we approved them, uh, and second, we can adopt them today. So move. So move. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Approved. Aye. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. have sign-up sheets in the back of the room, most you've seen this. Uh, we, we have some uh, fundraising activities ongoing for the National, I'm sorry, for the boys of the National Boys and Girls Club. And we'll be uh, collecting uh, donations from uh, Roast Brothers and Stop and Shop starting in uh, May. And uh, we've got the, the sign-up sheets right out there, so please sign up and think about that. Bring your calendars for the next meeting. If you have other items you want. Probably okay. I think that's fine. Okay. What I'd like to do is to go right now to our guest speaker. Uh, you've all come uh, today, not because of me, unfortunately, but because of our, uh, <laughs> our guest speaker. We're very, very 
fortunate to have the whole uh, talk today from the uh, Cape Symphony. Okay. I'd just like to make a couple of open remarks by saying that Marcia and I have been ushers for the Cape Symphony now for over 12 years. We have seen such a wonderful range of concerts during that time. It's just been incredible. And so it's been uh, a uh, experience that we will always remember. And our next assignment is going to be the 4th, the 3rd of April, uh, which is going to be the 60th anniversary celebration that weekend for the Cape Symphony. And they're going to be recreating the same music and program basically as close as possible to the to the first uh, concert, which was conducted on April 4th, 1962. So 60 years. Of a less significant note is I'm going to be, I, my birthday is on the day, April 3rd. I'll be ushering. I can't think of a better way to spend my <laughs> birthday than the Drum Hall Park and the uh, orchestra, orchestra. And also, uh, I am going to be 60 plus on that day as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, 60 plus and plus. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, at this, I'd like to introduce Joe Hopak. I'm going to ask you to introduce your guests, please. Of course, absolutely. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Joe Hopak, and I just wanted to um, remove this just for a little while. Um, I just wanted to ask, how many of you have been to the symphony before? Great. There are some. There are a few people who haven't. And you are my favorite people <laughs> in the world. Those of you who have yet to come to the Cape Symphony. I think there are people like, you know, there are dog people and there are cat people. And there are people who go to the, go to see the symphony. People think, maybe that's not my cup of tea. But I live for you, for those people who have yet enjoyed the Cape Symphony. As you've seen over the last several years, the Cape Symphony has evolved a tremendous amount over the years. And I think it really sums up very quickly uh, our mission statement. Our mission statement is perhaps the shortest mission statement I have ever heard or seen. And it's simply two words, and that is to inspire joy. Oh, it's not about preserving classical music. It's not about paying homage to Mozart and Beethoven, even though I love them very much. What it is, is about people. Art, not for art's sake, but art for people's sake. And in a time where our world is a bit crazy these days, it is great to do something that actually brings people together. As I like to say, I look out to the audience, and I do not see liberals and conservatives. <laughs> I just see people who are people, who enjoy being together, and who love joy and beauty. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes the Cape Symphony unique, and actually many of you know already. And then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Executive Director Michael Alba, who has been with us for two, little more than two very important years. And he's going to tell you some really, the, the fascinating uh, aspect of, the, of this whole COVID survival. Uh, the symphony is doing extraordinarily well, extraordinarily well. He's got a wonderful story to tell. But I thought I would just share just a few moments to remind you some of the heights of this Cape Symphony. I like to say that we don't give concerts, but we give shows. We give spectacles. We give experiences. We want you to leave the hall going, holy moly. <laughs> how in the world do that? And, and we always get people leaving the concert hall saying, that's the best show yet. <laughs> Every single show. <laughs> this is a, a program we did about, oh, I, I think about maybe five or six years ago. And it was called the Asian Silk Roads. And we had a cavalcade of guest artists. But this was really kind of the highlight. These were Korean drummers. And this is the first time traditional Korean drummers were paired together with a symphony.
now to show the diversity of the different types of musicians we bring on stage. Here is the end of an incredible evening that was just two, two years ago, right before COVID, a whole program dedicated to Africa. world onto the stage. I like, and indeed we do Beethoven and Tchaikovsky, in fact this weekend we're doing Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto Number no. 1 with John Nakamatsu, who is well known as being a co-director of the Cape Cod Chamber Music Festival, and it has been, it is our 60th anniversary this weekend, but for J John Nakamatsu it's his 25th anniversary of winning the Van Cliburn Piano Competition. Does everyone know the Van Cliburn yes. Piano Competition? Yes. yes. It is one of the most prestigious piano competitions in the world. It was 25 years ago, almost to the day, that he won this competition. Mm -hmm. And so he'll be playing Van Cliburn's very famous signature piece, the Piano Concerto No. 1 by Tchaikovsky. So that'll be on the second half. But as Bruce pointed out, we are going to be doing on the first half a recreation of the very first concert, almost to the day, that the Cape Cod Symphony Orchestra, that's what it was known back then, today we're the Cape Symphony, but back then, the Cape Cod Symphony Orchestra, a ragtag group of amateur musicians gathered on stage to perform a very ambitious program. And so we're gonna be doing Mozart's Impresario Overture and um, a very big showpiece by Chabrier called Espana. But all of this to say, ladies and gentlemen, that over the years, the Cape Symphony has progressed to become one of the most adventurous, innovative, courageous orchestras in the region. And now I'd like to hand it over to my colleague Mike, who's going to tell you this amazing story of how the Cape Symphony not only survived, but thrived over the last two years. Please welcome Michael Alba. Can everybody hear me okay? Do I need, do I need the, the piece? Can you trade the mics, please? Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> Is that better? Does that make a difference? Yeah. I saw some heads going, now you're the same. I got a booming voice and it carries, so I know. Um, so, uh, as John Hill introduced, I'm Michael Alba. Uh, you know, it, it was an interesting time when I was actually at that concert because I was interviewing for the job. Uh, and when I got the job shortly after the concert, you know, we, me and, and my wife Jessica, we started like getting things packed up and going through. And I was currently living in Philadelphia, where uh, you know Jessica was actually working on the Biden campaign. She's been in politics for 20 years, and uh, I was working at the Philadelphia Orchestra. And as the situation was unfolding, my very last day in Philadelphia was when everything shut down. Uh, the orchestra, we did the Beethoven, uh, we had a whole month of Beethoven planned in Philadelphia, and it was, we had run five and six, and we ended up doing the concert that night to an empty hall, uh, just because we felt like we should do it anyway. And then Friday, everything shut down. Jessica and I went home that weekend, packed up, and then we came up here. So the very first meetings I had with people were over Zoom, talking about what are we doing, the season's shutting down, are we shutting down multiple concerts, next concerts, and you can imagine the confusion of, you know, we have 180 people that work at the organization. When you figure 67 musicians, 54 faculty members, and another 30 in administrative staff, uh, there was a lot of chaos. We're in three locations in Hyannis, at Barnstable, and Falmouth, and I'm still trying to figure out where my mailbox is uh, because our previous owner took the mailbox with them. So <laughs> these were the things that I was dealing with. These are serious crises that's going on. Uh, but as we got in, we started having to take the time and realizing a couple months we had to cancel a few more concerts. 
Uh, and then we realize that we're in this for a long haul. This isn't going away anytime soon. And then when the town shut down and then the BPAC closed, we had to cancel the entire concert season. Now, for a symphony, we're, you know, we derive revenue from performances and those experiences. And with everybody kind of trying to be on hold, and yeah, why don't you come up and have a seat? Yeah. Make you stand. Thanks. That's for me. <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we found ourselves in a unique situation trying to determine how are we going to stay, stay afloat? Um, how are we going to keep moving? And we had to start making decisions about what kind of organization we really need to be. At that time, we were still called the Cape Symphony and Conservatory. We were literally two organizations. They merged in 2010, but they actually never merged. Uh, the Conservatory had its own administration, its own finance, its own marketing, and the Symphony had its own administration. They had two separate websites on two separate website carriers. And for a new guy coming in, it was kind of like, well, why are we duplicated? We're not even communicating. And there was, you know, well, the symphony gets all the attention, and we're doing all the hard work. And so there was a little bit of that kind of, you know, I don't want to say tension, but there was. There was, I'm going to be honest, there was tension between the, the two arms of the institution. So during this time down, we decided, well, let's, let's pull back and take this time. We've been given a gift of time. And I've always looked at life that everything that comes at you is an opportunity. No matter what happens, even when the hardest things in life, and I've had some hard things in life, um, they're an opportunity because they're time to stop, think, and think, okay, I am still here, I can still make choices for my life, and I can still help control the things that are within my control. Coming into the situation, that's how I looked at the institution. This is an opportunity for us. Sat down with the board, and we've started realizing that we've had some systemic problems. Now's the time to address them. Let's ask ourselves, what kind of institution do we want to be? Let's take stock in who we are. We have an amazing conductor, John Gopal. He's been here for years. <laughs> Honestly, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. Because many people don't know this, but he and I worked together at Interlochen Center for the Arts. For seven years together, we worked very, very closely together, running one of the most prestigious summer camps in all of the world. And, and so I knew I had a friend and an ally. And when he invited me to come up here and apply for this job, I knew that it was an opportunity for him and I to work together. And, and that, was, that was the phase one, so we knew we had that part in. Uh, we would look at the fact that we do, beyond great concerts, we have a very loyal su supporting uh, of cast. Here's a little known fact. In Philadelphia, ticket sales account for only about 25% of the revenue in Philly. And that's basically just known as an orchestra. Half of that money comes through fundraising, and another half through sponsorships and grants. So when I come here, I learned that like, well, during the height of 17, 18, and 19, we were driving close to 80% of revenue from ticket sales. That's unheard of in the symphony world. That is unheard of. And that has been sort of an industry standard since the 20s that we have known that that kind of revenue distribution. And that tells me that the community supports this institution. And that is a key word. The community supports this institution. So when I started visiting the education side, now, I, I'm a worked at a college, I worked at Interlochen for 10 years, education is the heart of who I am. Uh, and I believe in, I still teach kids out of Philadelphia right now in music composition, uh, which is where my background is. So I still believe in you know, the knowledge that we have and imparting and encouraging young people to move forward. And in seeing that we had these two conservatory schools, one in Falmouth, one in Barnstable, I was very excited. Because you know, people always question, was the merger right? Did that make sense yeah, for us to actually combine these two entities? And they never actually functioned. But realizing that you know, we were having such a success with so many kids and so many operations, uh, that was actually take stock in what we could do and to make the decisions on the things that we could become. And one thing in the pandemic we learned was that the preschools actually kept running. We became an emergency daycare center right out the gate. And thanks to the town of Hyannis, they actually opened up windows. Here's what you can do to run this safely. And for all first responders, kids were coming to us. Once we had the protocols in place, we decided, hey, let's just keep doing it. Uh, the, the talent has worked with us. We've got everything in safety. We actually built out another room, and then we just decided to keep it going to help keep the families at work. We were also able to move a lot of our education programming online. And a lot of the funders and supporters that came out to support programming said, like, let's just change it to operations because we believe in you. And so when they're making the commitment to believe in us and we're able to rethink our finances, then it's our commitment to make sure that we hold that promise true. And that's what we did. So we asked our questions. Do we need two finance departments? Do we need two marketing departments? And we started realizing that the problem that we were having was that communication, and we were separated. So we brought it all together. We all now have one institution. And we dropped the conservatory name, not just simply because of a marketing branding, but because we just wanted to be known, hey, we're the Cape Symphony. We're your Cape Symphony. And our job is to not only just provide great concerts and great education, but more or less is to actually work with our community. 
And one thing we wanted to change, we started using a word that we're calling engagement. And we started actually calling the education department the engagement department. We have an artistic department and we have an engagement department. We are all engaging. Whether we teach classes, whether we come to events like this, whether we work with other organizations and talk about <coughs> partnerships and how we can grow as a team and as a community. And the word community started bubbling up. And you'll hear Jung Ho mention a lot in concerts because we're a member of our community. We care, we listen, we just want to be friends and we want to work together to make the cave the best place it could ever be. Not only for art and young people, but just as, as a community. So we started opening up the doors. We started working with the college which is across from us in Barnstable, and they have students who come to us. We use facilities over there, so there was a nice relationship. We have a Y right next to us. We started moving programming to a Y and partnershiping with the Y, so we can actually spend all of the Cape, because the Cape, the YMCA wanted some more arts and culture, and well, we need more connections than running summer programming. So it seemed like a good fit. Sometimes we make connections where we just say hi, and we realize there might not be a, no immediate benefit. But we walk away at that meeting and say, hey, well, you know what? At least we made a friend. And that's the important thing, is through that friendship, there may be a time down the road where we see an opportunity. And the nice thing is, is like, call a friend, because we'll be here for you. And that's kind of how we're trying to change the optics of the organization, is through those optics. And through this process of coming around, we realized that we started taking stock and becoming a more communicative institution, uh, working together as an organization. So education and, and symphony, all things combined, and all things come out to make sure that we're making that difference in our community. And that's been our focus. And a lot of our funders, a lot of our supporters, they saw that. And supporters like you that have come to the symphony, that have you know, even written like $5 checks, we can't wait for you to come back. You know, Those were big encouragements for us. And as we came around to start this season, we put all the protocols in place we needed to. You know, I know that Vax checks are hard. It's hard on us. <laughs> Having to test the musicians before every concert and rehearsal is hard. But we wanted to do that because we wanted to come back safely. And we wanted to make sure that the community had that kind of trust in the kind of work that we could do, but making sure that people could then, you know, come back together and do so safely. And fortunately, we've been able to run off every show. Uh, we've had weather problems, thanks to the blizzards that keep coming through on performance weekends. But, uh, you know, I can always keep telling one thing at a time. But all of those things come together to make sure that we can actually have the part to work with you. But more or less, you know, the institution has come together in a very unique way. We find ourselves in a very good position uh, compared to where, from what Jung Ho tells me, we've been in a very, very long time. That we can actually stop, think, and plan where we want to go. So instead of actually working seasons ahead, Jung Ho's actually now thinking two, three years ahead. We're actually hoping by the end of summer, we've got 24 and 25 already road mapped out about the kind of programming we want to do, and not just in concerts, but the kind of community work we want to do. And through that has come some exciting partnerships. We've now uh, partnered with the town of Hyannis. So we are now the official symphony of 4th of July. Yeah. Every 4th of July in downtown Hyannis, we are going to do a right. concert right. with fireworks. Yeah. That really? is, and that is going to be a free event with a whole day of community events. Uh, we're also starting to work with a, uh, a free event in Martha's Vineyards, uh, which we're going to try to do every year in August. And we also are doing an event in the National Seashore. So we're trying to expand out of the Cape and then make sure that we can make these events free and accessible. Because we want everybody in the Cape to have an opportunity for the symphony. Uh, and these things are very exciting. The fact that the town made the commitment to put a line item in their budget for the Cape Symphony means that we're on the right path. And, and that's kind of you know, how I want to see things moving forward. So I realize I'm talking a lot, and I'm going to pass this back to our <laughs> superstar guest. But um, thanks for all for the time. You need to start thinking about something uh, yeah. for the concert in Mashpee. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, is I live in Mashpee. I live right over here, so I, I'm a Mashpee we, resident. Yeah, we, we did those for years. So we had that. Yeah, that's what he uh, told it me. Was, yeah. it, was, it was great, but somehow cranked into the formula, that, that, would, that would be super. <laughs> super. Well, he's also talked, because we're in Falmouth a lot, we're trying to find you know, a place to do Falmouth. And one of the thoughts, you know, John Ho has had was that can we split the orchestra up and actually have it doing runouts throughout the Cape? You know, I actually asked him one day when I moved here and said, you know, called him up and said, John, why are people just on the side of the road just kind of laying in their car, just sleeping, <laughs> relaxing? And he said, it's like, and it was interesting because I never forgot this, like, well, Mike, this, the Cape is one long piece of spaghetti. And if you have to go up one way, you just don't want to have to drive back and go over. So you kind of just sit someplace and enjoy the scenery. And then when it's time, you just move on. And I realized it, I never thought of it that way after, you know, 10 years of urban living. But, you know, even today, it's like, well, I live in Mashpee and I'm coming here. Well, I'm just going to work from home and then instead of have to drive out and drive back. So it is just a way of thinking about how your day is. But that's, you know, Cape Cod life. So, good question. Sure. We'll get back to Mashpee. Yeah. Awesome. I'll, re I'll remind you. Well, I'll be honest with you, we were close because we were working with Willow Bend, and we are still working with Willow Bend because Willow Bend wants to be more 
uh, inclusive to the community. So uh, don't be surprised if next summer something happens there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you can see why I'm very excited about the new oh and, and the new flip trade well, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, very excited. Why we're very proud to have Mike here to help lead us to the future. Um, I just wanted to conclude and just talk about the rest of the season that we have. And you'll be one of the very first people in the whole world that will get a sense of what we're going to be doing next season. It helps to know people, doesn't it? <laughs> well, the rest of the season, this weekend, as I said, we've got this spectacular 60th anniversary. John Nakamatsu doing the piano concerto number one. First half, the orchestra just doing a bunch of show pieces. Then a, a few weeks after that, we have the Beatles coming. Uh, well, kind of. <laughs> We've got an amazing group of performers who were former performers on a Broadway show called Beatlemania. Right. Oh, yeah. They look and they sound like the real thing. The arrangements are so good. The thing that people don't realize is that when the Beatles toured the end of their career, remember they stopped touring? Mm -hmm. Because they, they couldn't hear themselves play because of the girls screaming. So they, did, they concentrated on working in the studio. And that's where some of their best work came. And you know, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and all these other wonderful things, but it was never performed live until now. We've got these arrangements, we've got the Beatles band, and you're going to hear all your favorite songs on this Beatles concert. Mm -hmm. And then we conclude the season with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Mm -hmm. This is what this was supposed to be at the end of our 2020 season, mm -hmm. but we had to cancel it, obviously. So we're finally doing it. We're bringing a wonderful chorus from Boston called Chorus Pro Musica. Huge chorus, one of the largest choruses we've ever had. And they're going to be singing the Beethoven's Ninth. And on the first half, we're going to look at two important Beethoven pieces. One is the Moonlight Sonata on piano. Now, everyone knows it, but actually very few people have actually heard it live. I don't think I've ever heard it live. The Moonlight Sonata, it's a beautiful, famous piece that Schroeder would play at the piano. <laughs> and then also, one of the wildest string quartets ever composed called Grossa Fuga, which means the big fugue. It is one of Beethoven's crowning achievements, and we're going to have the principals of the Cape Symphony perform Grossa Fuga on stage on the first half as well. So that's going to be a spectacular end to their program. As Mike said, we have one of the most exciting and busiest seasons of the Cape Symphony. We've got that, the word is free. If you, if, you, if you leave this room and you go, what did he say? Remember the word free. <laughs> we don't give many free concerts, but this season we are, because we want to be accessible. Zero, zero obstacles to come see us. The 4th of July program with fireworks. The National Seashore at the end of August. And the day before that, and also in August, we're going to Martha's Vineyard to perform Jaws. Live with the film. Oh, fun. Yes. Uh, that's our international tour to Martha's <laughs> <laughs> And we're also, we're hoping, crossing our fingers, that we haven't fully announced it yet, but we really need to reach the younger generation. Of so we're going we're gonna to experiment and do our very first video game show in the beginning of August, too, with live orchestra. Some of these video games, this, the music is no longer Pac-Man. It's really sophisticated orchestral music and works beautifully with an orchestra. Next season, some of the highlights, and you, you'll probably, if you subscribe, you'll get this beautiful brochure. Some of the highlights include, for example, um, we're doing a, 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 a rendition of Scheherazade, which is one of the most spectacular tone poems ever written for an orchestra. And the violinist, the concert master, plays the female character of Sherazad who tells story after story after story. We're also pairing on the same concert with the radio show, The Moth. Do you ever listen to NPR? Yes. It is, the art of storytelling is alive and well. It is now, there are storytelling festivals around the country. And we're going to pair with The Moth to find a really great storyteller. And we're going to pair it with the orchestra on the same mm -hmm. concert. Mm -hmm. That's just one of many great masterpiece programs. On our pop series, wow. Broadway, just the best of Broadway. We've got a show of the best hits of Aretha Franklin with these three amazing singers who come and sing all of her hits. So as I said, we don't give concerts at the Cape Symphony. We give 
shows. shows. We give shows. And we want you to just think of us not only as a symphony, but the best way to spend the night out. We want to be your number one entertainment. We are the largest performing arts institution on Cape Cod. Per capita, per capita, we have some of the largest audiences in the entire country, per capita. Why? Because Cape Cod, as you know, is about 200,000 people through the year. Now, during the summer, it triples, right? But we service mainly throughout the year the residents, only 200,000. And we bring in at least 3,000 to 4,500 people together on a weekend. Those are enormous numbers for an orchestra. It doesn't sound like it, but we have a dream. We want to go from 1% to 2% to 10% to 100% of, of, of the Cape enjoying what we do. All right. So I'm going to stop here, and I want to thank you so much. But do, do any of you have any comments or feedback since you've got me and Mike here? Do you want to give any feedback about what your experiences have been over the years or things that we can perhaps do a little bit better or any ideas that you'd like to share? Yes. Yeah, we went to your concert for Greece. Greece, with yes. the movie. That was absolutely incredible. And I would love to see the sound of music done in the same format. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. We, that was our first foray into live orchestra with film. If you've not seen it before, you really haven't seen the film until you've seen it with a live orchestra. Mm -hmm. Usually the music is turned way down, but not with a live orchestra right there. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that feedback. I think you'll, you will be seeing us doing a bit more in the future. And for the sake of our television audience, that was a question about the Greece, your Greece concert. Yes. Greece. Yes, when we did Greece yes. uh, as, a, as a movie, you. right, that was our first We want to get this on national TV. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mom. It's <laughs> a great comment. Yes? Could I ask the two of you, we have a, a member of the club who can't be here today <clears throat> and asked me to ask you two. He's, he's written a symphony, and is there some way it can be given to somebody either at the conservatory or the or the U to see whether it's any good to give him, to give him feedback. Well, we get submissions quite a bit from people from all over the all over the region, um, wanting us to consider performing their symphony. And I would be happy if just have them reach me through the symphony, have them email it to me, and I will listen to it. I listen to everything. It, it, composers get very discouraged because usually they submit things to, to conductors and they never hear anything else. But I will respond, I promise. All right. All right. Your email is? What my email? My email is Pockmeister. <laughs> well, actually, I'll give it to you the Cape Symphony yeah, email. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's J Pock, J P A K, at capesymphony.org. Now you know how to reach me. <laughs> jpoc at kcp.org. All, right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? One of the interesting things I read in the uh, by information about the upcoming 60th anniversary concert was that Beverly Sills performed oh, yes. uh, back 60 years year, 60 years ago at that first concert. No. That, that's an amazing. It is true. It's absolutely true. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. The program book of Amateur musicians gathering for the very first concert, they had the world star, well, international star, Beverly Sills, sing two arias on their concert. Not wow. one, two really difficult arias. Talk about hitting it out of the park. And so we are, we're inviting our own soprano, Beverly Sills is no longer with us, but to <laughs> sing the same two arias this wow. weekend as well. Is that incredible? That is, yes. And it's a, it's a tribute to Beverly Sills, because Beverly Sills could have easily said, you know, I only perform with the Vienna Philharmonic, or I only perform with the New York Philharmonic. But she came to Cape Cod. <laughs> she lived on Martha's Vineyard. Beverly Sills lives on Martha's she Vineyard? She did, yes. Really? Yes, yeah, she did. Well, maybe so that's... So bring something into uh, your vineyard. Thank you very much. Was it her summer home? Her summer home. Her summer home. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's great. Yes. I have a question. How many members do you have in the, in the orchestra? Well, as regular tenured members, Mike, what do you say about 67. 67. Yes. And many of them come from the Boston area and yeah. they commute yeah. down here. So we should be very appreciative of that effort, especially during a storm. Looks like a lot of people on the stage. Yeah. There can be. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you.
And if there's a, yes, a question back here. Do you have, obviously you have different segments of your orchestra dedicated to some form of music, some type of music. Uh, could you explain that a little bit? Sure. Oh, I would say the overall core of our orchestra is very flexible. They can do Beatles, and they can do rock and roll, and they can do jazz, and they can do Mahler and Mozart. But we do have some specialists in the orchestra, like one person, one of our bass players, can play an excellent jazz and electric bass. So he specializes in, in that area. Um, one of our percussionists, Paul Gross, that you've probably seen, he specializes on the set. So when there's a rock or jazz, he's the gentleman who sits in, the, in, the, in that area. So some of, some of our musicians can play double duty and have other interests other than classical music. Do you have a chamber group? We do bring out our principal strings, and we bring out our principal brass. They, they play brass quintets, and, they, and then sometimes they'll play string quartets as well, like in the Beethoven program in May. They love chamber music. Musicians love chamber music more than anything. Yes. <laughs> One more question? Yes. Um, is the likely that in next year or something like that, the talk, pre-concert talks by, by Joe and George will be returning? Yes, in fact, they're back now. And when ah. you come this weekend, if you get there an hour early in the night auditorium, you'll hear George Shar give this week's presentation. And he'll talk about the pieces. If, if you've never been before, uh, they're free presentations for a half hour. So you get there an hour before the show, and you listen, and you go directly to the hall. It's so easy, and again, I love that word, free. <laughs> <laughs> but George and, and Joe are so charming, and they're so funny, and they make everything seem so interesting. Yeah, they're great. They are great. We're toying with the idea of maybe having them do pre-concert pre -concert pres video presentations so that you can see some of that information at home prior as well. That means. Well, well, yeah, 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 we'll think about that. All right. Well, I want to thank all of you, and thank you so much for inviting me and Mike to this wonderful event, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, well, my personal opinion is that the Cape Symphony is an absolutely crown jewel of Cape Cod. Yes. I mean that yeah, I from the heart. I really yes. do. Thank you. We're so lucky to have you as a resource at our end. And Sal's and Mike. He's uh, doing a great job as well, too. Really happy to hear things yeah. are going so well. But thank you very, very much for coming. Talk thank you. Thank you. We, uh, do we have anything else that we want to bring forward? Did you? Yes. We're going to have a raffle. Yes. Something? Yes, please. Russ, go ahead. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and I'm not using that term loosely, uh, I'm going to talk about something near and dear to my heart and also to your hearts, whether you know it or not. Trying to follow a fundraiser such as that gentleman who was up here is very, very difficult, but I'll try. Every year, for many years, we have put on different types of fundraisers for the Boys and Girls Club here at Cape Cod, right here in Mashpee across the road here. Um, we started out uh, with spaghetti gunners. Uh, <laughs> what a job that was. Uh, we did that for a number of years. Uh, we sold uh, uh, tickets, $50 tickets, for a few years. And that seemed to go over pretty good, too. And then um, we came upon a decision to let everybody in the community participate as much as possible. And that was, a few years ago, we started teaming up with Stop and Shop and Roach Brothers to sit in front of their wonderful stores and allow us to solicit uh, donations from the community after they spent as much money as they could in their grocery stores and left us some. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> what this boils down to is uh, that time is here again. We couldn't do this last year. 
We all know why. Couldn't do it the year before either, because we all know why. But um, it's it's time now that we get back into the community, let the community know that the Boys and Girls Club is still here and still active and still needs our help. So what we've done to continue our program as we have in the past, we've set up a schedule with Stop and Shop and Roach Brother of eight different weeks, starting in, um, and I have to look at this, excuse me. I have to have my glasses on too. Starting on May 7th and ending on June 23rd, or 25th. Uh, Roach Brothers one week, Stop and Shop the next week. Roach Brothers one week, Stop and Shop the next week. What we're asking is this. You see this sign up here? We're gonna have a sign at Stop and Shop, a sign at Roach Brothers, and we're gonna have tables and chairs at Roach Brothers and Stop and Shop for us to sit there, not have to stand up because we get tired standing for a while, I know. Believe me. Uh, so anyway, what I'd like to do is to talk to you about uh, asking you to spend three hours of your time on a Saturday, either from 10 to 1 or 1 to 4, either in front of Stop and Shop or in front of Roach Brothers. Um, last year, I forget what we raised. It was like... $8,550. Pardon? $8,550. $8,550. $8, and uh, we also uh, took donations from our own personnel here in, in the organization, in the club. Well, that was included. Yeah. Pardon? That was included in that number. Oh, that was included. Okay. Fine. And what that does, it allows the Boys and Girls Club to give out scholarships to what, two of the people? We gave out three last year. Three. 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 Three people uh, from their club to be used for their uh, for their education. Uh, also, what's left goes to them for their their general fund for operations. Well, uh, the, the scholarships go to the youth of the year and two runners up, and we have uh, uh, somebody from the club that sits on the committee that helps to select them. Uh, in spring, and this, they're handed out in July uh, at our meeting in which we have the uh, annual picnic, barbecue, and uh, the kids are there and so forth, get their scholarship, their certificates for their scholarship. And these, these kids are so appreciative, believe me. Um, they, bring, they bring a group of kids in from the Boys and Girls Club, and they're all just so excited and so anxious and so thankful of what we're giving to them. And believe me, it, it feels it right here in our hearts too. So uh, what I'm asking you is this, once again, please, in the bottom of your heart, help out. Uh, there are sign-up sheets outside there on the table, outside this room. Please stop and sign up. There are eight weeks, Roach Brothers, Stop and Shop, different times. You can sign up for the times and sign up for more than one, please if you can. And please make sure that your phone number is on there or your email address is on there so that I can get in touch with you and remind you. Yeah. <laughs> because we do sometimes forget at our young age. And, and so it, it will be helpful. So please don't hesitate and, and stop there at the table. Sign up. Do your duty. Help the Boys and Girls Club. Help yourselves. Make yourselves feel good. And I'm going to ask, lastly ask that write a personal check to yourselves. It should be made to the Boys and Girls Club. Boys and Club. Girls Club directly, yeah. So we have that. It's an ongoing uh, pledge that we have from our own people. I won't ask you what you want to give. I'm just asking you to give. Give of your time. Give up your huge income and uh, be thankful that you were able to do so and be thankful that you're being able to help the Boys and Girls Club of Cape Cod. Yeah. Anything it, else? It is our only fundraiser, so uh, we, don't, we don't have something new to try and raise money for every couple of months. We're only going to hit you only once. One. And the checks, if you draw them, draw them directly to the Boys and Girls Club, Send them to the treasurer. Um, 
and he also collects the solicited money as it comes in and uh, sends that over and it's all sent to the club. Uh, what else did I want to say about it? Uh, the good news is that we'll be, the signups will be here for the, for the April meeting and May meeting as well too. People to sign up. Yeah. Please sign up before, but you have well, opportunities along the way. We're not having an April meeting. We don't meeting. have I'm sorry, April May. I'm sorry, so May. So the next, the only meeting we're having May. before this starts sorry, that's right. yes. mm -hmm. is our May meeting. Yes, that's true. So please this sign up today. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Uh, is there something else for? Well, it's gone, it's gone so uh, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, put it, we'll put it in the newsletter. <laughs> yeah, we'll come uh, back. Uh, I'd like... Uh, any questions about this? Do we all understand? Okay. You got your checkbooks handy? Okay. Uh, you got your time slots? Oh, okay. Got your, your schedules Ross, out? We've got telephone numbers and email addresses in the roster. So the, well, the, please, the, print, the, please print your name. Yeah, just print your name. Please. Don't write it, because I can't read it. <laughs> okay? I'd like to say one more thing. Please go ahead. Out of the realm of this. I'd like to welcome a la young lady we have with us today, uh, whose husband Excuse me. It's okay. It's hard. We all remember. We all remember Dick so well. Yes. Whose husband was Dick Nelson. Yes. And Dick is going to be missed. He is missed. And we'd like to introduce Birgit, his lovely wife. Yes. <laughs> Welcome back, Bob, too. I was thinking about it this morning, even before you showed up. I said, I wonder if you would show up. Bob, uh, who's now uh, moved away from the Cape, was back this morning. We're really glad to see you as well. We have, we have another member that's here for the first time. Would you please introduce yourself? <coughs> Hi, I'm Mike St. Rose. Mike, nice to have you with us. And welcome. Oh, welcome. welcome back. Welcome and hope you come back. Do we have any other business that people would like to bring to uh, our attention before we adjourn? Okay. We. Uh, uh, motion to adjourn, please. So so moved. Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 We have a raffle 50, 50. now. The raffle is coming right now. Yes. Very good. I'm going to have you pick. Okay. <laughs> Just one. Yeah. And not your own. No, no, I, I didn't get one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hold on here. We have, the winner is me, no, uh, <laughs> two, four, six, nine, eight, three. Throw it up in the air. I'd like to thank everybody for coming this morning. Also, at the at the uh, May meeting, we're going to have uh, a guest uh, from the Playhouse in Catuit. Uh, Catuit. Uh, the director there is coming, and, and I'd like to also invite a wife and others as well too. That's going to be in May, and he'll do a nice job uh, talking about the programs they have there. So he's lined up to come in May, and then we're going to have our good friend. Uh, Dean Turner uh, as our guest speaker in uh, in June. So please mark your calendars. Please be coming back. Uh, thank God you're here. We had a great program this morning, an outstanding program. Uh, so I'm glad that you all made the effort to, to, to join us. And thank you very much for coming. We will see you all uh, uh, certainly soon, hopefully before our next meeting, which is done. So thank you for coming.